All right, joining me for this episode, actually, we're making history today. My first U.S. Army guy on the channel, Brian Casmo Harris. Casmo, it's great to see you. Hey, thanks for having me on. I, now I'm under a lot of pressure. That is exactly what Casey <laughs> Campbell said when I pointed out to her that she was the first Air Force vet that we had on the channel. As oh, I okay. said to her, I think I think you're gonna you're gonna do fine. Now I, I've been on your podcast. Yep. Um, let's tell the viewers what podcast that is. Uh, yeah, that's the the Low Level Hell podcast, um, and that's kind of uh, a, a lot of helicopter stuff for the most part, but then some jet stuff. So basically, I like to sell it as anything that's air to ground. I'm I'm all about it. So that's that's what I like to have on there. So we'll put the link for that podcast in the episode description. So look for that. But because you're the first U.S. Army guy to be on the channel, I want to talk about sort of career progression, and then we'll emphasize your Kiowa flying and Apache as well. So basically, this is the first time not only are we talking U.S. Army, but we're talking rotary wing uh, in, in any amount of detail. So why don't we start by talking about your progression? You, you, where did you grow up? Where did you go to school? How did you get commissioned? I grew up in Tampa, Florida, um, had always wanted to be a pilot. Uh, as I joke, no, nobody really told me you had to study hard in school to be a pilot. So, um, so my grades weren't all that great. And when it came time for college, uh, you know, I was having a little bit of hard times finding, finding where to go and the places that would take me. So I ended up finding this place. Um, I think they still exist. There are these places called military junior colleges and they're, so they're essentially, you know, a, a, a two year, two year school, you get your associate's degree. Uh, but the one I chose was called Georgia Military College. And uh, so it's a two year program. It's a it's a full time ROTC. You know, you're wearing a uniform five days a week. Uh, you have curfews, um, you have punishment, you have get up early for PT and things like that, which for someone like me was great because it forced me to, um, you know, to study and, and to get good. So I went from you know, marginal, not awesome high school grades to coming out on, you know, dean's lists and stuff like that in college um, almost overnight. So uh, that's a two year, like I said, a two year school. And then for me, I graduated. I still had two more years of college to get done. So I uh, I found the National Guard unit um, in South Carolina that was a, an armored cavalry unit and they were looking for lieutenants. I was a newly minted 19 year old second lieutenant with uh, with nowhere to go. So I, I interviewed with the commander there and they, they hired me essentially. Um, so then I finished my college at the University of Central Florida down in Orlando, uh, which was close to home, and then uh, would drive to, to drill every month and, and do the tank stuff. Um, so I did that for about two and a half years, finishing up my last degree and then uh, went on active duty and stayed as an armor guy for a couple of years, uh, was a mortar platoon leader. So I had uh, uh, M1064s, which are old, you know, the old 113s. It looks like just an armored box, uh, but it was modified. It had mortars in the back. And then uh, we did, I was in South Korea doing that. And then, you know, during that whole time, of course, I'd always still wanted to fly and I'd been around helicopters and stuff, but I'd never really put too much thought into it. Um, and then just by chance, I was at Fort Knox in kind of a desk job. And I started meeting these pilots, just just totally random situations, started talking with them and started to realize, like, oh, maybe this is still a thing I could do because uh, the army. And I'm sure we'll talk about that. The army is a little bit different with its pilots. Um, we have warrant officers and we have commissioned officers. I was a commissioned officer, uh, but we have warrant officers that do a predominant amount of the flying in the organization. Um, and so long story short, I ended up resigning my commission as a captain uh, in the army and became a, a warrant officer. And that's how I started flight school. And that was, uh, like I said, 2003 is when I started. And then, uh, late 2004 is when I graduated. Uh, and that was started my, my aviation career. Did you have to become a warrant officer to be eligible to go to flight school? Is that, is that why you did that? Why couldn't you no. just get a captain? So I tried and I'm glad I didn't. So there is a technique, um, it's called a branch transfer. Uh, because in the army you have branches, infantry, armor, aviation, artillery, blah, blah, blah. Um, I did put in a packet for a branch transfer and, uh, I did not get selected. It was very, you know, it was a very sm small group of people got selected and I got word back that said, Hey, you have a strong packet. Try it again on the next one and you, you'll probably get it or you might get it. The next one was six months away. So at this point it was like, do that or 
take the chance again. And I just didn't want to take the chance again. I kind of, like I said, I had it in the, had the bug had bit me at this point. I thought it was, it was feasible. Um, so, so I went ahead and just did the, the resignation and became a warrant. Uh, and then I did the warrant thing for about three or four years and then, and then basically flip flock back to, uh, being a commission guy in aviation. So I went from a, a chief warrant officer to back to a captain and just stayed as a pilot. So how does flight school go for army rotary wing? Uh, where, where, what are the phases? What airplanes do you fly? How long do they last? How long does each phase last? We don't learn airplanes, unlike every other branch, even the helicopter guys that fly in the Navy and the Marines, you know, they start on some sort of fixed wing airplane and then they move into helicopters. We just start at the bottom of, of helicopters and, and that's it. That's all you're going to do. And then if you get selected to fly fixed wing, since the army does have some, you'll, you'll go off and do that kind of as a, as a specialty or, or what have you. Um, when I went through, uh, it was essentially you had primary phase, which was, I want to say about 10 weeks. And then you had instrument phase, which I think was about eight weeks. And then you would go into your advanced aircraft. Now there's been some sort of morphing of those phases from what I understand and how they, they interact. But, um, essentially primary is like, I think anywhere else you learn the basics of how to fly the aircraft, um, how to do auto rotations and all the various emergency procedures and just how to be a pilot. What, what kind of airplane are you flying at that point? Back then, we used the TH-67, which is basically a Bell 206. Um, I think the Navy called it a TH-57, I think. So I, I actually have some some stick time in a TH-57. When I was aide to a three-star, we flew a Tomcat from NAS Oceana in Virginia Beach to Pensacola, where two H-57s were waiting for us. The Admiral got in one, I got in the other, um, right seat. And we flew to Whiting Field, which is where the uh, rotary wing training goes on for the Navy. Um, and on the way, we did some beach tail chase down the shoreline, and it was really a blast. So after that phase, where did you go and, and what, do you, what do you fly on until you get your wings? For us, the Army was kind of transitioning of how it trained your, what they call advanced aircraft. Um, so there was there was two different pipelines. And then basically, if you were on the higher end of the order of merit list, you went on the new pipeline. If you were the lower end, you went on the old legacy version. Um, for me, what happened was I finished instruments and I had been selected or I selected uh, the, the Kiowa Warrior, the OH-58 Delta, which is essentially a, a 407, Bell 407 that's been militarized. You go through a primary phase and um, a more advanced phase, a weapons phase, all that stuff with whatever aircraft you get selected. So with the Kiowa, I want to say it was about 16 weeks. You get to your first Kiowa unit, a fleet unit. What what year is that? Uh, that was, I want to say November of 2004. Uh, and that was, for me, Fort Bragg, North Carolina, which is actually where I'm at now, um, to uh, 1st Squadron, 17th Cavalry Regiment. Uh, well, actually, it was 1st Battalion, 82nd Airborne, and then they reflagged, you, you know, how the game is played. Units start changing names and stuff. Uh, but we belong to the 82nd Airborne Division, uh, which most people have heard of. You know, it's a, a Airborne Division with some renown uh, from from days of yore. Uh, but yeah, showed up there. And of course, at this point, this is 2004. Um, the war is, is kicked off. You know, the unit I went to had just come back from the deployment. So you had a lot of guys who'd already seen, uh, seen combat, had some experience. And then you had, you know, us new guys who didn't know, you know, anything from a hole in the wall. Um, and then we just started training, you know, just getting into it. Cause you knew the next deployment was coming. We were already scheduled. I think, uh, we left summer of 2006 was our first deployment to Iraq. Um, but, uh, yeah, just started doing the train up. And I think it's probably similar to, to what you guys have to go through. It's like you finish flight school and now you get to your unit. Now you got to learn all the rest. You know, it's, it's not like you just immediately you're good to go. There's still some things that you got to learn to do, particularly operating as a team and, and larger. So that's what we really spend a lot of time on. You mentioned 82nd Airborne. Um, and again, you're our first Army guy. So you, you get to go through some of the basics for us here. I embedded back in 2010 with the 101st Airborne. Um, and we flew H-47s and some H-60s and and we were supported by AH-64s while we were on the ground. But I basically had a, you know, soldier's point of view during the month that we were there. Uh, and that was really eye-opening and amazing. We were in Paktika province. Um, but um, 
I, I don't think I ever quite understood the overall construct. Uh, so when you say you're in a fighter squadron, you know, and I think viewers of my channel uh, understand by now that, okay, that means you're part of a carrier air wing. The carrier is part of a strike group. So where does a Kiowa squadron fit if you're part of the 82nd Airborne? And what are the other moving parts uh, of that? What, do you, what would that be called? A division? I guess I would look at a carrier strike group as a division, right? Because it's typically run by like an admiral, right? Like a two star or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so a division is a two star uh, uh, billet. Um, you've got brigades, which are tip. So in the 82nd, you had three and then four infantry brigades. So that was, you know, multiple battalions of infantry bubbas, you know, three, three, 4,000 guys, I think per brigade. Um, then you had the artillery brigade, then you had the support brigade and you had some other kind of hanger ons. And then you had the aviation brigade. So the aviation brigade, I guess I would picture is probably like the, the fighter wing, you know, for the, for the carrier it's run by a army colonel. So that's an 06. So a Navy captain It's going to have, uh, four flight battalions, um, or squadrons. So it, it gets really weird. You start getting into the heraldry of things. Um, but a flight battalion was run by an 05, a lieutenant colonel. So you'd have typically uh, units have your uh, attack battalion. So that's your Apaches, your back in the day, your reconnaissance squadron. And that was your your Kiowas. And the only reason they're called squadrons is that goes back to cavalry heraldry. It was just, you know, just the way it was called back in the day. Um, it's essentially a battalion, about 30 aircraft. Um then you had your assault battalion, which is your Blackhawks. And then you had your general support aviation battalion, which is your Chinooks and other Blackhawks. So like your medevac Blackhawks, your um, administrative like VIP and uh, command and control. And they did kind of did all kind of random stuff. Uh, and then like your, your Chinook company. So that was your uh, aviation brigade. So in our case, it was the 82nd Aviation Brigade. Uh, and then we had, like I said, the Kiowas, Apaches, Blackhawks, and, and Chinooks all broken up in that way. Did all 30 go when you would deploy? Typically for combat, we would deploy as a squadron. So when we deployed in 2006, the entire brigade deployed. The brigade headquarters, attack battalion, everything other than the Kiowa squadron, the, the cavalry squadron, went to Afghanistan. We went to Iraq and fell under the 25th Aviation Brigade out of Hawaii. So we were kind of like a, you know, tacked on to their brigade for the deployment. So when you say we, you mean the, the Kiowa the part of, of the division yeah. went to Iraq, the rest of the division went to Afghanistan, e the rest of the brigade. So this is where oh, things got okay. really wild because in 2006, 2007, maybe even a little bit earlier is when the army went to this modularity concept, um, sort of plug and play. So for instance, we were detached from our brigade in Iraq from the 82nd Airborne working for the 25th Aviation Brigade. And the people on the ground were from the 2nd Infantry Division. And then they swapped out with the 1st Infantry Division. So it was this huge just like shell game of just move units around and they're going to support these guys. It's just, you know, just overlapping uh, deployment cycles that you can you can imagine uh, essentially is what happens. So was that a function of op tempo? You know, we got two wars going on. Um, I, I guess those were kind of chaotic times, right? I mean, these are the same days that we had tankers deploying without tanks and, and that kind of thing, right? Yeah, that's right. Were you guys okay with that? Or was this the, were, were these uh, uh, not awesome times because of that kind of uh, entropy, let's say? I didn't think it was that big of a deal. Um you know, and this kind of goes back to training and standards. It, as long as units are generally working towards the same way. And of course, you, when you're dealing with the second infantry division and the first cavalry division, those are both heavy units, right? They have tanks, they have strikers, they have large vehicles. We came from the 82nd. We were working with dudes at Humvees and, and they walked, you know. Um, but fundamentally, based on the fact that we were all like my unit, we were all were operating in uh, Missoul in a big city. It really didn't matter. I don't care if that they drove tanks, they drove Humvees. It doesn't really matter to me. I'm still operating the same way that I would be operating. So other than learning new call signs and, you know, little idiosyncrasies, I didn't think it was a big deal. Now, have you, if you went to a high op tempo type situation like Ukraine, now it's going to matter because the way you operate 
as part of the 82nd is going to be vastly different than the way you operate as a first cab division. Um, because those divisions train to do different things. Uh, let's just go through a, a notional day in the life um, in terms of, you know, what sort of sorties you say it's a reconnaissance platform. Um, but walk us through really just a day in the life. You know, uh, what kind of sorties, how long, what were the nature of them? What gear were you using? How are you supporting the guys on the ground? I used to make a joke that the problem with doing nothing is knowing when you're done. And that's kind of the reality of patrolling in a coin environment. Um, our typical days were, you know, 12 hour days. You would, you know, you'd have this schedule, you'd wake up, you'd eat breakfast, whatever you'd go in and you'd get your, your daily brief. So that's your Intel guys telling you what happened yesterday and maybe telling you what they think will happen today. Um, you'll get your, you know, these are the spots we want you to look at. And if you really just did that, then you'd be gone for about 20 minutes. You know, it's really not that much like, oh, we think that this is where the enemy might put in IEDs today. Or we think this is, you know, this has been a historic spot for them to shoot mortars at the base. So this tasking is coming from brigade. So what you got to picture is you take this battalion. Like I said, there was 30 aircraft in our squadron. We have 10 in Missoula. We have 10 way out in Talifar, which is another, what, 50 miles or so away. We've got another 10 that are down at Spiker in uh, Tikrit, which is another 100 miles away. So we're kind of these little just independent units and, you know, with almost no adult supervision. And we're just operating in support of whoever, you know, quote unquote, owns Missoula. So like I said at the time, I think it was 3rd Brigade of the 2nd Infantry Division. When you say, let's go look for the, we think there are IEDs somewhere. Um that's just based on recce from the day before kind of thing? Or or how did you come to that info? It all depends, right? So some days you would get nothing from the ground force. You would get, you know, here's maybe you get a list of patrols that they have out. And they're saying, hey, we've got a patrol that's going to be running along this route from this time to this time. Your own intel guys will say, hey, we think that this is a possible rocket launch position. Maybe you should go check it out. Other times you would get, hey, we're going to be raiding this house or we're going to be doing a, what they call a cordon and knock, which is, you know, they block off an area and they start searching homes and stuff. Hey, we're going to be doing this. We need you to go provide support. So some days you get very specific guidance on what they want you to do. Other days, it's what we called flying QRF or quick reaction force. And you would just fly around the city because, I mean, you could fly around Missoula in 15 minutes. I mean, it's a big city, but for a helicopter, it's, you know, it's a 15 minute flight. So you basically flew for four to six hours waiting to see if somebody needs help. And a lot of times it happened. I mean, I remember one particular time flying over a convoy. We weren't talking to them. They weren't talking to us. They were doing their thing. We were doing ours. And right as we flew past them, we suddenly heard an explosion and gunfire. Well, they had come under an ambush, like literally 10 seconds after we flew over them. So we turned around and they had taken a, what was called a VS-17 panel. It's like an orange pan, a, a fratricide panel. It's like an orange you know, tarp. They had had it on top of their vehicle with their unit's frequency, their their you know radio frequency. So we quickly tuned up the frequency. It was like, hey, ground unit at whatever you know whatever location are you guys taking fire? And they're like, yeah, we just got ambushed. So now we're immediately working with these guys. The thing about being in a coin environment is probably one of the most important things is time on station. So fuel. So we would usually sacrifice ammo for fuel, but typically for me, I if I could carry uh two hours worth of fuel i would typically have a 50 caliber machine gun with say 300 rounds and then like four rockets he high explosive rockets or i could have you know three rockets and a hellfire so it was kind of a modular aircraft you had two weapons pylons and you could swap out what you had so some aircraft you had a rocket rocket you know which meant it had two rocket pods or it was a rocket 50 so it had a rocket pod and a 50 caliber uh rocket hellfire so you had a mix and match of these weapon systems that you would fly around with and maybe you get to use them. But, you know, you're in the city. Sometimes it's kind of hard to, to really engage a target because you know, there's houses and everything all around. Um, the Hellfire was great for that. It's a it's a hundred pound missile. So the warhead is much smaller than that. You know, in later iterations of the Hellfire, they came out with a lot more different types of warheads, more advanced uh, warheads. But then you had rockets, which are kind of like giant bottle rockets. They're going to go where they want to go. The 50 cal is only as good as your aim. Um, so having hellfires, I think was, was a good thing to have in an urban environment, but that's what we carry typically. Like I said, it wasn't a lot of ammo. It was typically just enough ammo to maybe break up a fight. Um, uh, cause we found ourselves a lot of times reacting to a ground convoy that maybe had come under fire 
and they're trying to break contact. So you can zoom in, you know, put a couple rockets into a, a, a house or shoot a missile. And it was enough to kind of, you know, break up that fight. A lot of times just showing up broke up fights. Um, there was many, many times where you would hear the call, hey, we need help at route, you know, drill or whatever. And we just beeline over there. And as soon as you show up, you know, they hear the the helicopter and they they scatter. You know, they don't want to deal with that. You know, your first deployment, the 06 time frame was kind of the Wild West in Iraq. Oh, yeah, it was. How long did that first deployment last? Uh, for me, six months. Um, for the unit, 12 months. And I say for me because I got shot halfway through. Um, so I got to come home early <laughs> and uh, and stay home. So talk to us about that that event. It was actually Christmas Day, 2006. Um, we came in and, you know, I expected we were going to come in and, and it was going to be what we call a no roll day, meaning the ground forces are not going out to to drive around and do a patrol. They're going to stay, you know, in their outposts. And, you know, if something happens, sure, people are going to go out and do stuff. But generally speaking, we're not going to go out and look for a fight on Christmas. Well, uh, uh, I was wrong about our our headquarters because our headquarters, we showed up for our brief and they said, hey, we're, we want you to go look at these locations. And I remember just kind of thinking, like, why, why are we doing this? And um, it was kind of eerie because um, two other guys on my in my um, uh, flight or, or my team, we kind of talked about it like I'm just not comfortable with today. Like, I just have a bad feeling about today. And, um, you know, no one's going to be around if we get get in trouble. And uh, so sure enough, we take off and about 30 minutes into the flight, we were cruising past an area that was a known kind of bad area of Missoula. And, um, I remember looking out the door and I, I was kind of zoned. I hate to say it, but I was kind of zoned out. I was just kind of thinking about something else. And I looked out the door and I realized I was looking at, at something that I knew immediately where I was. As soon as I saw this mosque, I was like, okay, I know exactly where I am. And I'm like, I don't want to be here. And I was literally turning my head to, uh, the guy flying the aircraft who was also my commander. Cause I was still a warrant officer at the time. And I was trying to think like a nice way to say, Hey, why don't we get out of here? Like, I don't want to be in this area. And no sooner did I turn my head and I hear gunfire. And I mean, gunfire, like you're at the range, you know, normally in a helicopter or an aircraft, when you hear gunfire, it's, you know, pop, 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 pop. If you hear it at all, this was like, brrr, you know, it was going down. Um, and we were very low, probably 50 feet off the, the buildings. So we immediately got hit. The aircraft started, you know, making noises and stuff. Uh, I was immediately hit in my right arm. So the, the round that hit me went underneath the guy sitting next to me underneath his chair, it went through the collective, right? The collective is how we go up and down. Basically. Um, it went through the collective and split and then it hit my arm in multiple locations. Um, another bullet went in and blew out hole through the, the canopy in front of me, my chin bubble down by my feet, by the pedals was blown out. We had, uh, multiple holes in the fuel cell, uh, a couple rounds hit the mast. One, one was found in the combustion section of the engine, had taken part of the compressor blades out of the engine. Like we took like a 13 to 15 rounds in the aircraft, which typically when an aircraft came back, it took like maybe three or four rounds. So <laughs> we, we took quite a bit. Um, you know, like I said, I was hit instantly. I mean, this arm just, it's not like in the movies where you're like, oh, that hurt. Let me get back into the fight. No, like your arm just stops working, you know. Was it excruciating, like a burning sensation? Pain? Yeah. Did you go into shock? I mean, what what happened? I always describe it as somebody takes a red hot poker, like a metal poker out of a fire and then jams it into your arm with a ball peen hammer. Like it was just intense f f flame and intense pressure. You know, it, there was no question that I had been hit. And what size um, round was it? Uh, a 7.62. I think probably from like an RPK or something like that, you know. Not like an AK-47. It was definitely so something a little you bit So you say bigger. you've got it. Did it? Was it stuck in your arm or did you just find it on the yeah. cockpit floor? No, they, the doctors gave it to me in a little jar oh, <laughs> when okay. I woke up. <laughs> okay. So were, the, were you the only guy hit in the airplane? Yeah. He, he Well, he got a little scratch. I don't know what where it came from. He's got like a little scratch on his, on his wrist or whatever. Um, but he was fine. But that was the scary part because, like I said, the gunfire, I could tell the gunfire came from my right side where he was at. When it started, he immediately kind of pushed the aircraft over and started diving to get speed. Um, meanwhile, the aircraft's making all kinds of warning sounds and stuff. I'm immediately hit from my right side. And my first assumption is he's dead. The aircraft is uncontrolled. He's dead. My arm still works. Like it takes a little bit before your arm stops working. 
And I grab the controls thinking, okay, I got to pull us out of this dive. And again, I go back to that thought of, I remember thinking like, there's no one around to save us. Like none of the ground forces are here. So even if we survive this crash, it's 50, 50 who gets to us first. Um, so I reach for the controls. I start pulling, but I realize immediately that he's still flying the aircraft. So I let go. He's flying the aircraft. One of the bullets that hit us, it actually severed the radio um, that we were using to talk to our wingman. So he's calling the wingman to say, hey, we just took fire and they're not responding. So our immediate thought is, oh, my God, you know, they've been shot down. So we start turning around to look for them and I'm kind of leaning out. We didn't have doors on the aircraft. So I'm leaning out the side of the aircraft, looking back and I see them kind of tucked in behind us. And uh, they call us on a different radio that they knew we were listening to the tower frequency. So they call us on the tower frequency and like, Hey, you know, we just took fire. I'm like, yeah, no kidding. So did we. <laughs> um, so then we turn back to the airfield. It's only like five minutes away and we get back to the airfield and uh, I get pulled out of the aircraft. They put me in surgery and I, I 24 hours later, I was in Germany, you know, and then, and then home. Was there some doubt about your, were you not physically qualified? Were you ever going to fly again? Were, were there yeah. Gray areas there. I was in therapy, physical therapy for a few months. Um, you know, I had, I had no range of motion. I mean, the, 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 the arm was useless essentially. Um, uh, but going through therapy and, and, and everything, it, it got back to normal. And then right about the time that I was good to go, uh, was the time my unit was coming back from Iraq. There was some talk of them getting extended. And I told my boss, I was like, if you guys get extended for longer, I'm coming back. I don't care. You know, um, cause you, it's weird. You feel like a, almost like a survivor's guilt. Cause I'm home. It's like, granted, I'm the one that got shot, but I'm home. All my buddies are over there. They're still in danger. You know, you, you feel guilty about it. You want to go back. Uh, but they ended up coming back on time. So it, it, it kind of worked out. Where did your career go after that? And, and, I guess I'm asking that when did you wind up in a, in Apaches around this time is where I decided to go back to being a commission guy. So, um, so right about when the unit came back is when I, I talked to my boss and said, Hey, I want to be, I want to go back to being a commission guy. And so what, what, what was that decision predicated on? What's, what's that matrix? I had already had a few situations where I felt like leadership were making decisions that I just couldn't, I couldn't understand it. And I couldn't, I, you know, none of us could, you know, we were all like, why are we doing this? And so that day it kind of reached the point of like, well, why are we going out on this patrol today? What are we going to gain from this? And literally the answer I got was we need to let the enemy know we're still here. Uh, we didn't just leave overnight. Now, granted, Afghanistan, I guess we kind of played that game. But, uh, you know, back then there was no just like packing up and leaving overnight. And so it was just kind of a silly response. And so then to get shot up, and for us to come as close as we were to what happened, it just made me like, I'd rather just put my money where my mouth is and try to make decisions on behalf of other people for, for the good of doing it. Um, so, so that kind of pushed me over the edge. And, um, and sure enough, you fast forward to 2009, 2010, we deployed and I was in the same squadron commanding some of the same warrant officers that I had been a warrant officer with. So, you know, we were, you know, friends, but now I'm their boss. In fact, it was this unit right here that I've got the flag behind me. Um, and now we're in Afghanistan and I will tell you exactly the same thing happened. I, I remember one day in particular being told by a, a major, you know, hey, we need to go do this thing. And I said, well, well, why? Like, what is what are we doing? What is the purpose? And he said, we need to provide presence. And I was like, well, the problem with providing presence is I don't I don't I don't know. That's not a tactical task. I don't know when it's complete. And so I just found a lot of times where we're just we're just trying to put numbers up on the board. Hey, we flew this many hours. Hey, we pumped this much gas like that's a real one. Um, you know, all these, all these numbers, I'm like, okay, but that doesn't win the war that doesn't win the counterinsurgency. Um, so I found that for me, I would rather at least be in a position where I could say that out loud, um, versus just being a warrant officer and just like, well, I guess I got to suck this egg, you know, like I got to do it. Um, so that was my driving train, but, but, but to answer your question, when did I go to the Apache? So the Kiowa started to get phased out. I want to say it was 2014. Uh, don't, don't get me wrong. I wasn't flying at the time. I was in a desk job. Um, but the army had, you know, tried to get the Comanche. Um, I don't know if you've talked, probably not talked about it on your channel, but the Comanche was the, the stealth helicopter, right? I mean, when I went through flight school, we were told, Hey, you're going to fly Kiowas for like two years. Then you're going to come fly the Comanche. And then the Comanche was canceled like a month later. Um, the Comanche was supposed to be the new reconnaissance attack helicopter for the army. It went over budget. It wasn't doing what it was supposed to do. So the army said, okay, screw it. We're going to cancel it. They took a ton of that money 
and put it into the Apache to make it more advanced. That's how you basically got the Echo model Apache. And the cost was we can't upgrade the Kiowa. The Kiowa is a very, it was an interim aircraft. It was always meant to just kind of fill a small time period. It started going well beyond what it had been designed to do. You know, the stuff we were doing in Iraq was not what we were meant to do. Um, and so the decision was, okay, we're going to, we're going to offload the cost of maintaining this fleet of aircraft and put all of our eggs in this basket of the, of the Apache. And then hopefully eventually we're going to build something. So you've, you, you hear about the future reconnaissance attack, I think is what they call the FARA, um, aircraft that they're still going to work on. Uh, so around, like I said, 2014, I think 2015, they started getting rid of the Kiowa, started phasing it out. And that's a very dramatic time. I'm, I know for other branches too, I've talked to guys who are in the air force, you know, guys who flew, um, the, uh, CH 50 or MH 53, you know, that started phasing out and guys were going to the Osprey. Well, not everyone, it's like musical chairs, right? When the music stops, not everyone has a chair waiting for them. And so you saw a lot of guys that suddenly didn't have a job anymore. You know, they, they got pushed into non-aviation jobs or they just got out of the army completely. Um, so I was very lucky to get transitioned over because part of me had always wanted to fly Apaches, you know, coming from tanks, the Apache is a flying tank. So it was uh, 2016, yeah, 2016, I think, 15, 15 is was, uh, is when I went to the air um, aircraft qualification course for the Apache. So that was after my second deployment. So I, I started flying the Apache in 16. Okay, Casmo, before we talk about the operational missions you did in the Apache, let's just do a cockpit fam. Okay. All right, guys, well, I'm going to give you a brief overview of the H-64. This one in question is the H-64D, brought to us by Eagle Dynamics. Uh, the newer model is the H-64E, the Echo model. Uh, but this uh, version is uh, roughly 2006 time frame. We'll just kind of take a look at uh, some of these uh, components. So first thing to note is the pilot station is located on the back. Now that's the primary pilot, and then the co-pilot gunner is seated there in the front. Now, both of these are rated Army aviators. Either one can fly in either station. We're both trained to fly in both situations. Uh, it's just a matter of crewing of who wants to sit where and, you know, just kind of depending on the mission. Now, looking at the front here on the nose, you can see two different sensors. Uh, the bottom one there is what we call the TAS, the Target Acquisition Designation System. And that's typically what the front seater will use. And then the one on top is the Pinvis, the pilot's night vision system. And that's what the pilot will use. And both of these can uh, transmit information right into your eyeball. So we look there at our crew members and you can see that they've got that helmet mounted display system over their right eye. And that is essentially how that information, as long as, uh, as well as other flight information uh, gets broadcast to you. So uh, most fighter jets will have like a HUD. That is essentially the HUD in the H-64. And we'll talk about that here in a few minutes. All right, so we can see taking a look at the aircraft, it's currently armed with some Hellfire missiles and some rocket pods. So looking over here on these pylons, we've got some AGM-114 Hellfires. These are laser-guided anti-tank missiles. And then next to that, we've got a 19-shot uh, uh, rocket pod, which could be loaded with a variety of different types of rockets, high explosive, white phosphorus, illumination, flechette, uh, as well as uh, in the more modern times, we have uh, actual laser-guided rockets. And then here underneath, uh, kind of situated below and between the two crew members, is the 30 millimeter cannon. This is a hydraulically controlled chain gun that uh, can be controlled via the TADS, uh, that sensor there uh, that we talked about, or it can be controlled from the pilot's uh, uh, the helmet sight, the helmet mounted device. So you can slave this to your head, turn your head, and squeeze the trigger and engage targets. We do have a variety of systems to uh, protect the aircraft. Here you can see uh, down there at the bottom that little black hockey puck thing. That's a radar warning antenna. And right above it is an EOM. So that uh, basically was looking for uh, heat plume signatures for like a missile launch, something like that. And then back over here, you can see that we've got a laser detector. That's looking for any sort of laser energy that might be directed at the aircraft. And then those are scattered uh, as well around other places. Uh, here on the wing, you can see another EOM. And then back here on the tail, on the boom, you can see another laser detector. And then back here on the very end of the tail, you can see more of those radar detectors. You can see that the engine exhaust is uh, funneled upward. 
And this was an effort to uh, basically push some of that hot exhaust gas up into the giant spinny fan and cool it down, thus decreasing the uh, thermal signature of the aircraft against things like uh, infrared guided man pads. All right, so there's the aircraft. It weighs about uh, 20,000 pounds, a little bit more. And we'll jump into the cockpit and just kind of take a quick look around. All right, so here we are in the back seat. Again, uh, both crew members can fly in either seat. They're both trained to do both. Uh, but we'll just take a look around the back seat. First of all, I'll just bring up that helmet mounted display real quick. So I've got it turned off. Uh, and I've got the penvis on right now. Let me turn that off. So now you can see that HUD that I was talking about. It's going to go wherever uh, I turn my head. And then if I turn on that pilot night vision system, that little turret that's up at the front, uh, at the top, we can kind of see it. I'll turn it on and you'll see what it's, uh, what it's broadcasting to me. And this is a FLIR image. And you can see that turret came to life. And as I turn my head, you might be able to see that turret moving just a little bit. And this is essentially giving me uh, forward-looking infrared right into my right eyeball. So when we're flying around at night, that's essentially how we're seeing uh, what we're seeing. We can fly with night vision goggles as well. However, Apaches typically will use the FLIR. I'll turn that off and I'm going to remove the HMD and we'll just take a quick look around the cockpit. Uh, starting on the left side, we've got our lighting control panel. Uh, we've got some jettisons. We've got our power levers. This is uh, essentially how we would uh, turn on the aircraft. And our APU, which we're currently on, the auxiliary power unit, our zero eyes. This is how we turn on that night vision system, unlock the tail wheel. Here's a keyboard for us to put in whatever information we need to in the system. This is how we control the the uh, the light of the, the FLIR and the HDU. We can safe and arm the aircraft here. Since we're on the ground, we'd have to do the ground override. Can canopy uh, jettison. This is how we would put out fires if there was a fire in the engine or the APU. We can test that real quick. Here we've got the upfront display. This is just giving us uh, radio information, cautions, warnings, and advisories that the aircraft wants us to know. And here we've got the MPDs, and these are multi-purpose displays. These are going to tell us all kinds of information here. On the left side, we've got the tactical situation display up, uh, which we can move the map around. We can change the scale. We can set waypoints and targets. We can bring up our weapon systems, take a look at our weapons, and set those up, change laser codes, change the, how the warheads operate. Uh, you know, Whatever functionality the weapon system allows us to do, we can inter interface with it here. We can set up our communications and all that good stuff. We can check on our aircraft and see our uh, torque values, our temperatures, our rotor uh, torque, which is really what helicopters kind of live and die by is understanding the, the torque on the engines and the speed of the rotor and check some other engine parameters, some hydraulics. This is a flight page we can use while we're in flight. So you can see there's just a ton of functionality with these two screens. We've got two of them so we can kind of you know, however you like to set it up, I typically flew around with my uh, TSD on the right and my weapons page on the left, or I could bring up video and bring up what the front seater is looking at in his video, and that way I could maybe help, or if he's a junior guy, I can make sure that he's not looking at the wrong thing, things like that. Now, the MPDs uh, were new to the Delta model. Uh, the old Alpha model was uh, typically uh, gas or uh, steam driven gauges like these over here. So you'd have, you know, just kind of a normal old school airplane cockpit. Uh, but as they came onto the, the newer age, we've got this, this glass cockpit set up. Down here, we can uh, change the volumes of our radios and just kind of mess around with the, the way things sound. This is a little storage compartment that holds the HMD that, again, we have attached to our helmet. It's actually attached to the aircraft. So you would take it off to get out of the aircraft. And then when you get back in, you know, you, you strap it onto your, your helmet. Here's the door. And that's how we would shimmy our way in and out of the aircraft. And here's our M4. This is where we would actually kind of stick the M4 from the back seat. And here's like a little armor side panel uh, to hopefully keep you safe from ground fire. Here's our CMOS control panel. So this essentially uh, is how we control the uh, distribution of the flares and the chaff and set it up for... Uh, whether we want it to be on auto mode or if we want to manually control it. All right, so we'll jump into the front seat and take a look there. All right, so the front seat has a lot of the same features as the back seat. We've got jettison stores, we've got lights, we've got the we've got the power control levers. 
emergency, the keyboards, we've got the uh, MPDs here on either side of what is called the TDAC, which is the TADS Electronic Display and Control. You can see over here on the left and right, we've got these hand grips. They've got all kinds of controls, which are uh, in some cases duplicated here on the collective. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, but this is essentially a way to control the TADS. So I'm going to go ahead and action the TADS. You can see I'm just kind of moving it around. I've got that FLIR. I can change it to a day TV, uh, but typically we're using FLIR if we can. And uh, again, I can action the weapons. In fact, I'll go ahead and go to ground override. We'll go to arm and we'll go outside. And I'm going to move the tads around. We can see that's moving. Now I'm going to action the gun. We can see that the gun is now going to follow the tads. And that is a way that I can use that to engage targets. The other way is to uh, action it off of my HMD and then just have the gun track my head motion. Over here, again, we've got the communications control panel. We can turn on the windshield wipers, uh, store HMD. Here is our rifle. Here is our door handle. A little bit harder to get in and out of the front seat. You're gonna have to slide your way in and out. Uh, one thing I didn't talk about in the back seat, uh, but they are replicated here in the front, is our cyclic. And that is how we fly the aircraft. Now, this is in a stowed position. And now we've got it unstowed. Because typically the front seater is not flying. Uh, however, I typically would not stow it just in case something happened to the back seater. I'd want to be able to grab the cyclic quickly without having to reach down and unfold it and all that stuff. Uh, but you can see this is the cyclic. This uh, controls the pitch of the blades somewhat individually, allows us for directional control. I'm not sure if you can see that the blades are sort of changing their pitch a little bit there. Where are the other ones at? You can see that they're changing pitch a little bit. And that's how we directionally control the aircraft. And then over here is the collective. And that is how we collectively control the pitch of the blades. And that is essentially, do you want to go up or do you want to go down? All right, looking back here behind me, uh, last thing we'll talk about is uh, these are the sensors essentially for that I had system, that helmet mounted display. So there's little uh, IR sensors, if you will, on the helmet and little emitters. And this will uh, pick up essentially the direction of your head. So you, you get into the aircraft, you bore sight it off of this little device here. That way the aircraft knows which way forward is and which way you're looking. And so that everyone's kind of on the same sheet of music as far as what you're looking at. And then from then on, once you've boresighted it, whenever I turn my head, as long as I'm inside the cockpit, it knows where I'm looking. Now, if I were to lean way far to the left or right, then I might be outside of its sensor range and it won't necessarily know where I'm looking and things will go a little bit crazy. Uh, but as long as you kind of sit the way you're supposed to, uh, you turn your head, the aircraft knows which way you're looking and, and what you're doing. And, and that's pretty important, again, with that uh, helmet mounted display. Uh, because it's going to, at certain times, give you information based on what you're looking at. So based on putting that, that line of sight cue on something, uh, it may it, it's going to, de to determine that you're trying to do something at that point, whether it's trying to uh, get a, a range in that point, or maybe it's even trying to uh, point a weapon system at that point. So, Casmo, thanks for that cockpit, fam. Very cool. So talk to us about your first Apache deployment. Where'd you guys go and what did you do? Well, this was uh, 2017, 18 timeframe. So as you know, ISIS, you know, was the thing. We had left Iraq, then we had come back to Iraq. And now we, we were also operating in Syria. Um, so our deployment uh, came right on the heels of the battle that retook Mosul. So ironically enough, Mosul that I'd been in uh, years before, uh, had ISIS had pushed all the way in and now U S coalition forces had pushed them back out. So we showed up a couple months after that had happened. And now ISIS was basically pushed all the way out of Iraq. They were still operating. They still had cells and things like that. Uh, but generally speaking, they were, they were in, um, Iraq or, uh, Syria. So our deployment was a short one. They were trying to, um, re resynchronize, I guess you could say schedules, you know, kind of reference to what we talked about earlier, where you know, had units that just kind of didn't make sense. They were trying to resync that stuff. So our deployment was only about a five month, which is short for the army. It's long for everybody else. Um, we deployed 
very, we were all over the place. So I had a troop of eight Apaches that went out to uh, Afghanistan, a troop of eight Apaches that went to Erbil, uh, which is in northern Iraq. And then uh, we had another troop of eight Apaches that were kind of split up. You had some in Syria operating in support of the, the special operations that were there. And then some other ones that were down at um, Al-Assad in southern uh, Iraq. So we had guys everywhere. And then we had support personnel in Kuwait. We had maintenance set up in Taji. At one point, I think we had 13 different locations that we had the squadron uh, across four different countries. So we had stuff all over the place. Um for us in Iraq, we spent most of our time just kind of patrolling the, uh, you know, the highways and the river valleys looking for ISIS operations going on there. And then our guys in Syria were doing a lot of direct action with the special operations that were over there, um, uh, particularly. And this was very early in this deployment. In fact, while we were still ripping out with the, the last unit was the um, not Russian contractors, quote unquote, uh, who had made a push towards this oil refinery and then the U S forces responded and it became a Turkey shoot. Uh, it was, it was pretty dramatic to watch this happen, but two Apaches, a bunch of cast platforms, some artillery, and they just clean these dudes clocks to the point that no kidding. We are in Iraq thinking, did we just start world war three? Are these like the, the Wagner group dudes? Is that who we're talking about? Yeah. The guys who were on that mission. Like I, I know them. I've watched the gun camera footage from that mission, like the unedited stuff. It was absolutely wild. Um, you know, we, we joke that you're the first Apache guy to see an enemy tank in your sights in the past, you know, 20 years. <laughs> and they didn't get to shoot because the JTACs were managing the fight and telling them to shoot at something else. Um, so yeah, the Wagner group situation, I can't remember the, the, the place, but, um, yeah, it was pretty intense just to even watch and it, it really added a lot of tension. And so around that same time is when Turkey and the Kurds were not getting along. So, you know, on one hand we're flying jets out of Turkey into Syria to bomb targets. On the other hand, we're flexing Apaches to locations with the Kurds to prevent the Turks from coming in and fighting the Kurds. It was this like, you know, war of the five armies type situation. It was a very strange uh, environment. So in general, let me ask you to do the Pepsi challenge between the Kiowa and the Apache. What are, what are the two differences from a pilot's point of view of those two airplanes? A Kiowa is, is basically a militarized civilian aircraft. The Apache you get in, it's like, this was purpose built to do what you're doing. Um, and so that was very cool. And again, being, in, I'm sure kind of like a Tomcat or really any fighter that, that's tandem, the ability to see out the left and right was really cool. You know, you get in a Kiowa, you're like looking past the other dude, you know, you're like, getting. it's kind of like driving a car, you know, you wait for the other guy to get out of the way. I, I love them both. I think they both have some great, some great things. The 30 millimeter on the Apache is absolutely just awesome. The ability to just flip a switch and that gun moves with your head and looks at what you're looking at and you just pull the trigger and, and things go kaboom. Uh, is super awesome. The ability to carry more than like four rockets at a time is also pretty great. Uh, so there's definitely some benefits to to both platforms. Now, as as well as being an airline pilot, you're you're very active in in DCS, and you host your own podcast. Um, so yeah, uh, talk talk to us about those those efforts. I kind of goofed around during COVID and made a a, a, a YouTube channel um, where I do mess around, like you said, mostly with uh, DCS. And some other things. And then uh, during that time, I met some interesting people. And one guy, you know, after talking to me for a while, I was like, hey, you should start a podcast. So so I did. Um, and like I said, I think earlier in the beginning, the Low Level Hell podcast, uh, which is, again, primarily a helicopter kind of focused show. Uh, but we do have other types of guests. And in fact, I'm trying to expand it a little bit. I've got some special forces guys that I know that'll, that'll come on and things like that. Um, so, yeah, so I've been doing that for, I guess, about two and a half years at this point. So, Casmo, thanks very much for your 22 years of service. I think you've served the Army well here by being our first Army guy on the channel. So good work there. And uh, look forward to talking to you again very soon. All right. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. All right. That's going to do it for this episode. If you're not already a subscriber, click the button and ring the bell so you don't miss anything going forward. If you'd like to help support the channel, please consider using the super thanks, the heart icon below, or become a patron at patreon.com slash Ward Carroll. And in the meantime, I look forward to talking to you again very soon.